Hello, my name is Michael Dwan Herrick. I'm a psychotherapist and a life coach in private practice in London. Welcome to this 36th episode in my series titled Questioning Woke Psychotherapy. In this video, I want to talk about what is good about woke, yet how it often pushes that goodness too far, causing more problems than it solves. First, I want to say that by the time the critical social justice movement started calling itself woke, which was in the 2010s, it had already gone too far, in my opinion. So in exploring the good part, I'm looking into the precursors to woke, the values from which it grew. These were and still are good values, but the woke's extreme pursuit of them has created further problems, which I'll talk about shortly. From the beginning of the series, I've acknowledged that there are valid moral intuitions and impulses underlying the woke perspective and agenda. So what are these good intentions? Having started Eric Kaufman's online course at Buckingham University titled Woke, the Origins, Dynamics, and Implications of an Elite Ideology, which I highly recommend, I'm going to borrow from what he has to say at the beginning of the course. Kaufman identifies three strands of values that provide the early basis and seeds for woke. These are liberalism, humanitarianism, and egalitarianism. Kaufman provides a history of these movements, identifying key thinkers and writers and social groups that adopted these causes and pushed them forward. I'm not going to get into that history here, as it would take too much time. What I will do is describe the basic orientation of each of these strands of thought all three of which provide the basis for what came to be called woke. Let's start with liberalism. The key value of liberalism is individual liberty. It emphasizes the rights and freedoms of individuals, including freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association and assembly, and other civil liberties. It believes that individuals should have the autonomy to make their own choices and pursue their own interests without undue interference from the state or other authorities. Critical social justice clearly values individual liberty and champions anyone who is suffering any form of oppression or any constraints on their personal choices for how to live. Just a few of the major victories of liberalism that I think most of us will agree are a good thing include the abolishing of slavery, freedom from rigid sexual stereotypes, and freedom from the confines of religious communities. So how does critical social justice go too far with this? It seems to me that when it absolutizes the value of freedom, it sets out to destroy whatever it deems to be an obstacle to it. It deconstructs all norms or consensual agreements about reality that are held by a majority or dominant group. Via critical theory and a postmodern view, it assumes that all such things are merely social constructs, arbitrarily fabricated by an oppressive group for the sake of maintaining its power over oppressed groups. Objective reality and the needs for social norms for the sake of social cohesion and collaboration are rejected as they impose limits to individual freedom. This extreme expression of liberalism results in a dissociation from reality and the absence of any social contract. It fails to recognize that not all limits to individual freedom are due to the unjust impositions of an oppressive class of people. On the contrary, I would assert that many limits to our freedom are due to the constraints of reality and the necessary structures for social organization. Constraints that we disregard at our own peril. What about humanitarianism? The key concern of humanitarianism is to alleviate human suffering and promote human welfare. It focuses on providing assistance, protection, and support to those in need, regardless of their background, nationality, or beliefs. For those vulnerable to harm, humanitarianism steps forward to reduce that harm and therefore reduce suffering. Some of the things done in the name of humanitarianism, and which most of us will agree are good, include international human rights laws that ban cruel and unusual punishments, the improvement of horrible and dangerous working conditions, 
child labor laws, emergency assistance for those experiencing a natural disaster, poverty alleviation programs, and refugees, refugee assistance for those fleeing conflict and persecution. So how could protecting people from harm and promoting their well-being go too far? Simply stated, when the definition of harm is expanded to include anything that causes discomfort, including words and ideas that may be experienced as offensive. When the impulse to provide protection includes protection from the emotional or psychological harm caused by microaggressions, for instance, then it may go too far. For one thing, it begins to impinge on the freedom of speech by imposing steep consequences for anyone expressing an opinion or perspective deemed to be offensive and therefore harmful. This not only curtails the freedom of speech for individuals, it's also an obstacle to potentially useful dialogue. When only one perspective on a problem, or only one problem for that matter, is allowed, and only one set of potential solutions is acceptable, then we miss out on other useful perspectives and solutions. We might also ignore other problems that could be addressed toward relieving unnecessary suffering. Beyond this, by protecting people from encountering anyone who disagrees with their views, with the idea that such a thing poses an existential threat, we promote fragility, not well-being and resilience. And finally, egalitarianism. This is a philosophy that advocates for equality among all people, regardless of their background, status, or circumstances. It promotes the idea that all individuals should have equal rights, opportunities, and treatment under the law within society. Egalitarianism opposes discrimination and inequality, striving for a more just and fair society where everyone has equal access to resources, opportunities, and basic human rights. Some victories of egalitarianism include the successes of civil rights movements and the fight against racial segregation, discrimination, and inequality, leading to legislative changes and greater societal acceptance of equality and diversity. Gender equality, progress in women's rights, resulting in increased access to education, employment, employment opportunities, and political representation for women around the world. LGBTQ plus rights. This includes the legalization of same-sex marriage, anti-discrimination laws, and greater visibility and acceptance of LGBTQ plus individuals in society. Disability rights. This includes improvements in accessibility, accommodation, and inclusion for people with disabilities, leading to greater participation and integration in society. These victories represent ongoing progress in the pursuit of egalitarian principles and the realization of a more equitable and inclusive society. While not everyone celebrates every one of these measures of progress, most reasonable people will applaud the fundamental idea of equality when it comes to opportunities, rights, and equal treatment under the law. What could go wrong with this? It seems the first mistake was to assume that any disparity of outcomes between groups can only be caused by some form of discrimination. Based on this, the aspiration is not only for equal opportunities and treatment, but for equal outcomes. In order to justify and accomplish this, there must be an imposition of unequal treatment for different groups. For instance, whites and males considered to be the privileged beneficiaries of discrimination that disadvantages other groups should not be equally allowed to access opportunities based on sufficient merit. People of color and women, even when not demonstrating traditional standards of merit, should be given access to the same opportunities. In other words, inequality in the name of equality, rather than seeing what can be done to help people cultivate the necessary merit for different opportunities, the shortcut of discrimination is chosen. This is unfair to those who demonstrate merit but it also sets in motion a corrosive effect on the quality of education and the fields and professions that are supplied by graduates. Not to mention it sets up people to fail who are not prepared to compete at high levels in certain domains. It also fosters resentment 
and those who feel unfairly treated. For social justice activists who feel passionately about liberalism, humanitarianism, and egalitarianism and their agenda for realizing these values, it's easy to see how they would construe opposition to their mission as antagonistic to these basic values. Such opposition is perceived as morally deficient. It is often characterized as far-right bigotry, racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. Such people, it seems, to the woke, just don't care about the rights, freedom, well-being, or equal treatment of anyone but their own in-group. While this is undoubtedly true of some people, it simply doesn't explain all or most opposition. It falsely assumes that objections to its decrees and mandates can only come from people who don't understand or agree with the principles of liberalism, humanitarianism, and egalitarianism. In other words, bad people. It's also easy to see how those who oppose the woke mission may not recognize or appreciate that these three values are at its roots. And to be a bit generous, these are still generally their concerns. This deep source of potentially shared values is overlooked, and the woke can be seen as and labeled as idiots or insane or even evil in their own way. The bridge that might connect the woke and the anti-woke is buried under mountains of divisive rhetoric and social media silos driven by algorithms facilitate and fuel the process. Outrage grows on both sides. In very general terms, I believe what is needed is a remembering, revival, and embrace of these core values that represent some of the greatest ideas of Western culture. While yet imperfectly realized, they are worthy of our continued effort. At the same time, I believe that pursuing these values needs to be in the context of recognizing the natural constraints that limit any perfect idealized vision of each one. No one is or can be absolutely free. No one is or can be safe from all harm. Not all people realize equal outcomes in their lives or ever will. Yet within these constraints, we can still optimize our realization of these values and refine our system of justice toward that end. We can be mindful that when we try to impose a utopian system on all people in the effort to manifest an absolute vision of these values, we are likely paving the way to disaster. I like this quote that's attributed to George Orwell, although he may not have said it, quote, a revolutionary will tell you that you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Ask him, where is the omelet? And he'll tell you Rome wasn't built in a day. If an omelet is a realization of a fair and just society and breaking eggs means letting go of things that stand in the way of that, then the cost of broken eggs may be worth it. But if the vision of a fair and just society is a naive utopian dream without a chance in hell of being realized, then we risk breaking perfectly good eggs, the cost of which is hard to estimate or predict. And to be clear, these eggs are the legacy we have received from our ancestors. Some deserve to be broken, but many are precious and were hard won. The woke, via critical social justice theory, have been busy breaking eggs without, it seems, any effort to discern which might be worth keeping. Liberalism, humanitarianism, and egalitarianism are three eggs they have managed to break or weaponize to break other eggs. In this way, they've gone too far. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel, click the bell for notifications, leave me a comment, and share it with a friend. Until next time, Take care of yourself and each other. Please join me for my next video. Bye for now.